Hey guys, Nishquick here. So I played through the Metaphor Refantasio demo twice and exceeded at least 10 plus hours into this demo. Just the demo in itself, so I can't even imagine how much time I'm going to spend in this game. So in this video, I just want to go over and reflect on my experience with the demo, what I thought about it, and just give you guys some detailed thoughts on what I think about this game so far, since I'm very, very, very excited for it. Before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for giving so much love to that latest Metaphor Refantasio video. It is already my fourth most watched video on the entire Nishquick Pops channel. So thank you guys so much for supporting that, sharing it, liking it, letting me know your thoughts in the comments. And also thank you to everyone who showed up for the live stream where I played through about maybe half or so the demo of Metaphor on my PS5. And one quick reminder, if you guys enjoy JRPGs, Nintendo games, and are excited for Metaphor, Refantasio, one last time i'm gonna ask you guys give this video a like and subscribe for more metaphor content just like this and if you're interested in catching videos early and maybe even suggesting some content for me to produce on the channel consider joining as a niche quick pops member anyways let's get started and i want to tell you guys exactly what i thought about the metaphor refantasio demo so I'm going to start off with negatives, and you guys might be like, Nishkoi, negatives? You're so hot on this game. You've been checking out so many of the trailers, you've been excited for it since day one. And I agree, I'm very excited for this game, but there are some things, some minor things, that are a little bit of annoyances for me and things that didn't sit right with me at all. So first of all, this is just an Atlas and specifically a Persona 5 thing. Even in Persona 3 and 4 I noticed this, but it was very prevalent in Persona 5. The dialogue is immense. There's just paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of dialogue piling on top of you one after the other after the other. And I think the annoying part for Persona 5 and a little bit with metaphor I've been noticing is you have some dialogue with your characters, you walk a couple feet forward, you notice something, they react to it again, you're in a standstill, they're reacting to whatever they saw, you move forward, they react again, and then you move forward a little bit again, and then you get into a battle. So there are times where I just feel like I don't feel like getting this explanation or this exposition or this dialogue dump immediately in that moment and maybe I just want to figure things out for myself. Persona 5 did that a lot in its first Kamashita arc, I remember this, and even much later into the game in some of the high octane moments where I'm just like, hey, I want to just play the game, characters like Futaba and Makoto and so on and so forth were just explaining things over and over and over again about the story or what's going on, and things are happening like that in metaphor as well. It's better paced, but I'm still noticing that a bit. One thing I was really excited for with metaphor was the fast combat so it's kind of like the action combat in the overworld and honestly it's fun to do it's a lot of fun to get the enemies break bar down and then move smoothly into a squad or a turn-based battle but the fast combat isn't as fluid as I was hoping in terms of attacking and dodging and moving around it's not as fluid as I hoped but it's still a lot of fun and it feels very refreshing coming from Atlas's other games like recently playing Persona Persona 3 Reload, uh, Shin Megami Tensei 5, and then of course Persona 5 Royal. It's a lot more action oriented and more faster than those games, but I was hoping for a little more fluid action combat, but that's not too big of a negative in my opinion. The best thing about fast combat is, depending on which archetype you have equipped for the main character, your fast combat is going to change. So when I was using a healer, it was like I was knocking them on the head with a mallet, where as I was using a mage, I had like this AoE kind of wind attack or like an ice attack. Or when I was using the brawler, I was using like slow punches. And then with the warrior, it was a huge sword I was just smacking down on them. And there are some archetypes I haven't even used in the overworld yet, like the knight. I wonder how the spear or the halberd is going to play into the fast combat as well. And then one final negative before I go into gushing about how amazing this demo was is... I noticed a lot of people online saying that the protagonist being voiced was like a really great addition to this game, and it was, and it's great in some instances, especially in the cutscenes, but there are some instances where I feel like 
you give a response for the protagonist to make and I was hoping that the protagonist would talk a little bit more than just the simple dialogue prompt that I gave. And in those instances, it just felt like a Joker or Yu Narakami who's just voicing his dialogue prompts. I was hoping that this protagonist would have a little more agency and a little more dialogue and a little more of a speaking role in this game. And he does, especially in some of the cutscenes from the past where you see him talking with the prince and then you see him talking with characters like Hulkenberg and Grius and Stroll and especially Maria later on in the demo. But I'm hoping we see a little more of this and maybe we see the protagonist open up a bit. Anyways, that is all I had for negatives. Let's talk about everything that that I'm really vibing with in this game. So I'm gonna go in order of how I experienced it and just kind of jump around a bit, but the timestamps will be in the description down below. So first of all, something that really stuck out to me was the presentation of the story, the presentation of the lore, the cutscenes, all that was just amazing. Of course, the animated cutscenes are phenomenally animated and look even better than they did in something like Persona 5. I love how the characters look, I love how emotive they are, I just really like the presentation of the story and characters in this game. Another thing I'll talk about a little later on in this video is there are some very important cutscenes and those cutscenes are done in engine and those also look great. Like some of the party members whenever they awaken into their archetype or another big story moment I'll get into later into a spoiler section, a lot of that was done in engine and it was so nice, so smooth, seeing these characters in engine just move around and I was playing it on PS5 and PC with that high frame rate and good crisp visuals, it just looked great. And the presentation of the story and lore is very well paced because I remember this one cutscene where the main character and Galaga are running through the desert and then they get caught by this huge sand serpent and it just transitions very smoothly, very nicely into an exposition of what the United Kingdom of Ukronia is, what just happened with the king's demise, the eight nations and the tribes and all that. It just has a very grand scope and the way that it's telling the story is very very well done. And one thing that is a very big factor into all of this is the absolutely phenomenal voice acting at play here. This is honestly up there as one of my favorite English dubs in all of like JRPGs honestly. That's such a big statement to make and this is only the demo that I played around 10 hours or so. but. Oh my gosh, like some of these characters sound so great. Of course, Stroll's voice actor Stuart Clark, we knew him as Dion from Final Fantasy 16, so I knew he was gonna bring his A game for this. But so many other characters are so phenomenally voiced and I'm so excited to hear everyone else later on in the game. Like, so many, like these multitude of characters that I haven't even met yet. I'm so excited to see how they sound, how they interact with the main character. I love how Hulkenberg sounds. I love how, what her voice actress has done with the character. And another big standout to me was Captain Klinger. Very, very funny, very comedic role, but also got that menacing energy into him as well. And I also loved Grius' voice actor. I'm going to talk about a little bit later on as well. Also, one quick thing, I want to give a slight spoiler warning. If you want to go into Metaphor Refantasio or start the demo without knowing anything, then I suggest maybe clicking off this video. But if you want to know a little bit about the story and characters and get a little bit of a premise and my impressions, then definitely keep watching. But there will be a heavy spoiler section later on in this video where if you don't want to know any story bits about anything that happens in the demo, then I suggest you definitely click click off there, but I'll warn you when we get there a little bit later on. So once you enter Grand Trad, you get more info on the story, your mission, your goal, and the fact that you're an Elda, that your main character is the Elda race, it just permeates through this part of the game quite a bit. Right when you touch foot on Grand Trad, you're being inspected, you're being judged, you're being ridiculed, you're being scammed, you're, there's so many people out to get you just because you're an Elda, 
and I am very curious what the origins of the Elder Tribe are. They give a little bit of hints in this demo, and I was talking about that with another fellow Metaphor fan and content creator, John from Thought Bubble, and he actually has a video coming out on the Elder Tribe, so you guys should keep a lookout for that and see what he has to say, but there's some really good setup with a lot of the story stuff and a lot of the interplay between the different races and tribes in Metaphor, which I'm really looking forward to digging into more. And speaking of all the lore and all the tribes and all the different factions at play within this game, the memorandum is a fantastic fantastic feature to have and it seems to be similar to the active time lore feature that was in Final Fantasy 16 and I didn't look into it much because I was just having so much fun with the demo playing the game getting into combat watching the cutscenes that I need to just take some time to go into the memorandum read all the entries and understand what all these tribes and what all these factions are doing and what their motivations are and what their history is and I'm so glad that they have this feature in this game because it was incredibly helpful to have that feature in Final Fantasy 16 and especially with games like this that are very expansive have so much lore and history and different people at play within the factions and characters and tribes and all that it really helps you stay on top of the lore and understand what's going on because sometimes people might throw out terms and terminology and names and things like that that just kind of go over your head, but if you have this memorandum or active time lore, you can always go back and refer to it, which is super, super, super helpful, even during the dialogue, which is great. I really hope many other JRPGs and story-heavy games include this. I'm looking at you, Monolith Soft, add this for Xenoblade 4, please. And after playing this demo, I can confidently say that right now I can see four plot points that tie together to make the four major pillars of Metaphor Refantasio's narrative, and those are the mystery of the humans, the world in the prince's book that Moore has written, the tournament for the throne, which hasn't even been fully truly set up yet, and the plot to kill Lord Louise. So I've noticed that all these elements and all these plot points are coming together and all these four plot points tie together very well and complement each other to make the story, lore, characters, and world building interesting and very intriguing. So moving forward a bit, I want to talk about some of the main characters that you see in the demo. Maybe not all of them, but just the ones that stood out to me. And I will say, I want to talk about this guy first, Grius huge standout with this character. I love that he was a mentor kind of character, but he also had a strong connection to a lot of the characters presently, like of course the prince, to Gallica, and because of his connection to the prince and Gallica, he sees a lot in the main character and the protagonist. Also, loved, loved, loved his voice acting. He's got that thick Scottish accent. And what's funny is, I don't know if my fellow Xenoblade fans notice this when playing the demo, but there's a part as you're approaching the Nord Mines where Grius says, don't forget one wrong move and I'll cut you down. And when he said, don't forget, all I could hear and all I could think was our beloved Ardanian soldiers. Don't forget. One wrong move, and I'll cut you down. Dude, when he said don't forget, with his Scottish accent, and him going don't forget, that really gave me some Ardanian soldier vibes. Don't forget. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Stroll is also a great character. I've seen so many people really enjoying his character and saying he's already best boy. And it's a really nice play on your... OG bro, I like to call him, sort of like your Junpei, Yosuke, and Ryuji. I loved hearing about his backstory and seeing what his motivations truly were to go on this journey with you and Grius. Hulkenberg is also not what I thought she'd be, and honestly, I was surprised when I saw her in the first trailer in June 2023, after seeing all this art for, of the Project Re Fantasy Night with red hair. I like her formality so far, but I'm really interested to see her in different scenarios in different situations and seeing what her character does later on in the story. 
Galaga is also, so far, one of my favorite companion characters. And when I first saw a lot of her, I thought that she'd be really annoying like Morgana, but she's really fun to have around. Also, a really great addition to the story revolving around the prince, Grius, and the protagonist. I'm really curious and excited to learn more about her past with everyone else that she knows and interacts with. Luis also seems like a very formidable villain, but right now, all I see is a typical noble trying to ascend to the throne, but what makes me most interested in Luis is how he managed to become so powerful and influential in the military and curse the prince at such a young age. So I'm really curious to learn more about how he started off so young and got so OP at such a young age. And lastly, I want to talk about Moore, who is arguably the character I'm most interested and intrigued in. I have so many questions surrounding Moore. Why was he trapped in academia by the king? How does he know about our real world, since he was the author of this book that we're carrying around? And what secrets does he have about the archetypes and the connection? to the world of Uchronia. I'm so excited to learn about all of these things and more once I get my hands on the full game. So now I want to move on and talk about the gameplay a little bit. So honestly, my favorite part of this demo was just running around, exploring and battling in the many dungeons that we got to experience in this demo. So the lead up to Nord Mines was great because that's where I truly mastered the fast and squad styles of combat. And I was able to learn the best risk and reward tactics for battling other enemies that were stronger than me or weaker than me or around the same level as well. Nord Mines was also a blast since it threw a lot of tough enemies at me and I really got to understand the benefits of having the SMT press turn system in Metaphor Re Fantasio's combat. Also, a really small touch that I really liked is I love how face sight works with the overall design language of the game. Because whenever you're strong enough to kill an enemy with fast combat in the overworld and you scan them with face sight, their silhouette kind of shatters to reveal that their outline has changed from yellow to blue. And that was a really nice touch that really fit in with the overall aesthetic and design of the game. And I think this is a good time to transition and talk about the performance that I've had because I played this demo on three different devices. I played it on my PlayStation 5, which I streamed on the channel last week. I played it on my gaming PC, which has a Ryzen 7 5800X CPU and a RTX 3060 Ti GPU with 32 gigs of RAM. And then I also played a bit on my Steam Deck as well, and I managed to get a little bit of everything experienced on all three of these devices. On PS5, it was a pretty good and smooth experience despite some slight drops here and there, but it was nothing major that I noticed. It was genuinely a really smooth 60 FPS. And I played the PS5 version for about 7 hours or so. I stopped when you get free reigns of the character to explore and do whatever you want in the three days leading up to the end of the demo. So that's where I stopped. I didn't even go into any of the end of demo dungeons on the PS5. But if you want to check out my experience with the PS5 version, I streamed it on the channel last Thursday, and I streamed up till the end of the Nord Mines dungeon, and then two days later, I started the PC version. So specifically, I started the PC version on September 28th, and I understood that the prior week there was a lot of really bad performance issues on all various devices and there were some egregious Steam Deck performance issues and I saw uh, King Narakami 45's video on this, shout out to him, he made a really good video showcasing the unfortunate performance issues on PC. That got me nervous, I was like, I really want to play this game on PC, I've been wanting to play this on PC and Steam Deck, so I was a little nervous, but since I started the demo on September 28th, I noticed that Atlas 1 acknowledged the performance issues on Twitter and social media, and not only did they do that, but they went ahead and patched the PC version to run a lot better, because when I played it on the night of the 28th, 
it was running very, very smooth on my rig, and I was really surprised to see the game running very smoothly on high settings. To give you guys an idea, it was staying around the high hundreds in FPS, and the lowest it dropped was probably in the mid 70s, which was in the Grand Trad uh, capital area. It was very unfortunate that many people were struggling with performance in the game, actually not even utilizing your GPU, but utilizing your integrated CPU graphics and all the Steam Deck performances, but I have to really acknowledge and really thank Atlas for stepping up and acknowledging the performance issues on PC and also patching them out to make them run a lot better and a lot smoother. So thank you so much, Atlas, and I'm very excited to play the rest of this game on PC and Steam Deck. Speaking of Steam Deck, the Steam Deck performance was not too shabby either. So I set a TDP limit and I also capped the frame rate to 45 so the game could conserve some battery and not have as many frame drops. And to give you guys an idea, the Nord Mine section ran at a perfectly smooth 45 FPS, as well as the other dungeon that I'll discuss a little bit later on. But the city of Grand Trad did have some frame drops, but nothing really that ruined my experience and seemed unplayable. So I'm gonna really enjoy playing this game on Steam Deck and having that portable option because I don't have a PlayStation portal. And this game is unfortunately not coming to the Nintendo Switch and the Nintendo Switch 2 isn't out yet. So continuing on with my experience with this demo, and especially when it comes to the combat, the builds, and the archetypes, I just wanted to give you an idea that I played a lot of this demo on my PS5 and on PC, so I made sure to try to get a little bit of a different experience between these two save files, and of course, that mostly had to do with my archetype loadouts. So I'll give you guys an example. So in the Nord Mines, I battled the optional dragon both times on PS5 and PC. When I played on PS5, it was actually a little easier because I had a little bit of an advantage in some ways. If I remember correctly, Grius and Stroll were warriors while my protagonist was a mage. And because my protagonist was a mage, I realized that the Blizz ability or the Ice ability was weak against the dragon. So I remembered that I can have more mages this time around. So when I realized that I should have more mages with the Blizz ability, I decided that I should make Stroll a mage when playing the PC version. And I'll tell you guys why this may not have been the best idea. <laughs> First of all, unfortunately, I didn't level him up enough to learn Blizz, so the dragon fight on PC slash Steam Deck was actually more difficult because I didn't have a skill that would give me the upper hand. <laughs> but this failure was also a great lesson to me with the archetype system since I realized that learning new skills actively and having the proper setup can make or break your chances at winning any kind of battle in this game. And also the formation is very important. So when I made Stroll a mage, I was so excited to use Blizz on the dragon that I didn't realize not only did he not learn the skill, but he was also in the front row and was fodder for the dragon to slash him to death. So he was always getting insta-killed until I put him into the back row. And these mechanics are seen in all these other games like Final Fantasy, Persona, SMT, Dragon Quest, so on and so forth. But the inclusion of these mechanics with the archetype system expand them and make them so much fun to play around with, honestly. One more thing I realized when playing around with archetypes is I remember there's a part in the game after the Nord Mine section, I think more specifically tells you that you should be mindful and very careful who you teach specific archetypes to because of course archetypes cost magla which is a currency for studying new archetypes and learning new archetype skills but i realize that certain characters will have more affinity and will play better as specific archetypes and learning every single archetype for every single character is probably not the best approach to go for and i thought back at my PC experience with fighting the dragon, was it really a good idea to make Stroll a mage if he's more of a attacker? I could have done it with Grius because I think in hindsight Grius might have had a bit more magic on him, so having the main character and Grius as mages while Stroll stayed as warrior would have been a better option. And I played around with this a lot more in the later dungeons that I experienced and it taught me the best 
and most optimal ways to gear up my characters for what's to come in the future. So moving on to some other parts of the demo, I want to fast forward to when you get a little bit of freedom to do whatever you want in the remaining three days before the demo ends. Basically that feels like your mission start before the deadline in any Persona game. And it was basically the same in Metaphor as well. What was interesting is I figured out through some friends and through the Metaphor subreddit as well that there is a way for you to get one of your social stats, or in this game they're called Royal Virtues, up to level 2 so you can initiate a side quest with the igniter merchantress Brigida, which takes you to a pretty difficult and high level dungeon with a lot of really annoyingly high level enemies and probably the hardest fight in this entire demo which is this giant minotaur looking creature just because i wanted to explore and do as much content in this demo as i could i jumped at the chance to do this dungeon but i remembered what i learned in the metaphor showcase to always ask around in town for any informants to give you any information that will give you a little bit of an upper hand in combat in these higher level side quest dungeons and this guy was telling me that you can't be a mage or a healer any kind of magic in this dungeon will aggravate the monsters and the enemies inside so naturally i changed everyone to a warrior or a knight so i was going in there doing a lot of melee attacks just piercing through with melee attack after melee attack and it was getting exhausting and it was getting really difficult because these goblins were really tanky and then eventually i got to the end and then i realized that i need to level up some of my other archetypes i brought in the mage and the fast combat with the mage really helped me with plowing down some of the goblins as well but that's when i realized that getting into squad battle with these mages is what's going to hurt me since any trace of magic detected by them will initiate their frenzy which makes them go all berserk and you will need to either heal or revive or restart the battle this is where i really started to play around with inheritable skills with the archetypes and i got really creative with it because i remember more was saying that these inheritable skills or just learning any archetype skills can cover your weaknesses or exploit on some of your advantages within this game so i thought that it would be a really good idea to expand on the knight and see how the knight can synergize with other archetypes because you got these synthesis attacks as well which almost completely flew under my radar i only used them in the mini boss fight earlier and then i sort of forgot about them but this boss this minotaur boss was so insanely difficult i lost miserably twice to him and that's also because i th came in with a mage i came in with a mage and he got all frenzied and berserked and he annihilated my main character in an instant and I went in with the mage just like how I did with the dragon because this guy, this minotaur, was weak to ice. So I was like, I have blizz on my mage, how about I just use the mage and see how far I can get? But no, it didn't work out in my favor. And then I remembered inheritable skills. How about I get everyone on my team to at least learn blizzard magic so whatever archetype they are, and specifically whatever archetype that isn't mage, if it still has the blizzard ability, I can still cover for that inadequacy there. So I went in with this fight. I went in with Stroll as a warrior who had Blizzard if I needed it. I went in with Hulkenberg as a knight which came in very handy because the warrior and knight synergy attack was very very strong against this boss. And then I specifically went in with my main character as the seeker and not a mage or a healer but I made sure the Blizzard magic was on him. So I was getting a lot of press turns, remembering all the skills I learned from SMT5, and eventually he went down. I was very proud of all the effort and the work that I put in to this specific dungeon and this specific boss, because that made me really understand the extent of what I can do with these archetypes, how I can exploit weaknesses and expand on advantages and cover for disadvantages within my 
characters in my party. One other thing I really learned in this game is a lot of the archetypes have some bonuses that they'll give you if you're utilizing them as the main characters, specifically if you're using them in fast combat. So near the middle of the dungeon when I realized I need to reshape my strategy against this boss, I was severely low on MP, like really, really low. And I was at a loss because I'd used up all my MP consumables and I thought I had to reload an old save and just redo the dungeon. But turns out no, the mage has this really awesome ability that if you defeat enemies in fast combat, you can regain a bunch of MP for yourself and your party. So initially a lot of these enemies were still outlined as yellow, so I couldn't just entirely eliminate them with the snap of my square button or my X button on my Steam Deck. And I had to really think around this. So what I would do is that's when I really learned how to dodge, how to evade, when to use fast combat, when to evade. So I was almost playing this game for a bit like an action RPG, just so I can use that MP tactic to refill a lot of my MP so I'll be ready for the boss later on. And doing a lot of this, help me kind of grind a lot of my characters, get them to a higher level. So eventually, when I went all the way back from the end of the dungeon back to the beginning, a lot of these enemies were outlined as blue and I could just plow through them without having to stress out and be in a very stressful turn-based squad battle. So this dungeon, despite its difficulty and despite how hard and grueling it was, it was probably the highlight of the demo experience for me because it really opened me up and opened my eyes to what the archetype system is, what the gameplay system is, what the dungeon experience is like, and a lot of these dungeons were pretty simple visually, but it was still fun exploring every nook and cranny trying to find the treasure, seeing what enemies I find, seeing what treats and goodies and loot I could find as well, and just hearing the music when the battles and the overworld, it was just a fun time all in all. So in this part of the demo, I'm going to get into some serious spoilers. So I warned you guys at the beginning of the video that this will be about the demo, it'll have sort of spoilers about the story and characters, but this is where I'm gonna get really serious into spoilers. So if you don't want to get into the serious spoilers of this demo or anything, this is now your chance to click off and thank you so much for watching to this part of the video if you got this far in. Anyways, I will say one of my favorite cutscenes in this entire demo experience was when the royal magic is triggered and the king comes down in that kind of moon-like face and triggers the royal magic and sort of starts the tournament, but the tournament doesn't officially start. I think that's gonna happen a little later on in the game, past what we've experienced in the demo. Like I said earlier, I love how this specific cutscene and some other very important cutscenes like Stroll and Hulkenberg's archetype awakenings are done in engine to show that they're really important, really very monumental and landmark moments within this game. And this is one of, if not the best, one of the top tier Atlas cutscenes that I've seen with the voice acting, the framing, the cinematography, all that stuff just came together to give me a very really one-of-a-kind cinematic experience with Metaphor Re Fantasio. And I said this a lot in my live stream, I think, and I've said it in passing with other friends as well, but I was right. Grius had death written all over him, and unfortunately, even though he met an untimely demise, I really liked his character, and he really is kind of like a catalyst to this game. And I loved how he had a relationship with every single one of our main party with Gallica, with the protagonist, he had a profound impact on Stroll, and he had a very long history with Hulkenberg as well, who knew him as Alsis, and Hulkenberg's archetype awakening was very emotional in the fact that she almost admits defeat and accepts her death in the hands of her once mentor in knighthood. After she awakens into her archetype, she she's confident in following us on this journey to end Luis's tyranny and save the prince. One final thing I'll say about the demo is I really enjoyed the dungeon to search and find the necromancer, but I was kind of bummed out that it was 
so short of an experience with this dungeon. I was hoping that we would at least be able to experience the entirety of the dungeon, because this demo seemed to be like this is the first arc of Metaphor, sort of like how the Kamashita arc or the Yukiko arc were the first arcs of Persona 5 and Persona 4. So I was really hoping that it would be sort of the same with Metaphor, we could experience this entire dungeon and get a kickstart into the story later on. But after a mini boss in the dungeon, it was just kind of cut off right there and I was slightly bummed out, but it's not a big deal. I'm very excited to play the rest of this dungeon and I also realized that depending on the way you experience a demo, you can either get the merchant archetype and complete the demo without going into the main dungeon or you can go into the main dungeon and get the brawler archetype. So I unfortunately didn't get to play around with merchant but I did get to play around with brawler and that was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's basically everything I had to say about Metaphor Refantasia's demo, and I'm very thankful to Atlas for providing us with this demo to give us a little bit of a sneak peek as to what this game is. I'm seeing a lot of people in my comments of my prior video saying, hey, I wasn't sold on this game, but I tried the demo, now I really liked it, and I just pre-ordered it. It's really opening people up to this game, giving people a chance to experience it and get their hands on it. Even a lot of my friends who went to Gamescom again this year were initially like metaphor looks cool but i don't know if i'm gonna get it immediately but then when they got their hands on the game and played it at gamescom they were even more impressed so i'm so glad that people outside of anime expo gamescom summer games fest and press events and previews finally got to play this game and finally got to play some of the major parts that everyone else got to play i'm very excited to see what the reviews of this game look like and all that stuff and if you haven't tried this game out if you haven't tried the demo out just know that all your save progress is going to carry over into the main game it's i would say four to eight hours and maybe even more depending on what you do of legitimate awesome jrpg atlas level content this is one of the best atlas games i've played and i can confidently say that just from playing this demo and I cannot wait for the final release. So thank you Atlas for giving us the chance to play this demo and for also patching the game on PC. That's a big kudos to you guys for stepping up, noticing the issues, and patching the game out. I really appreciate it. So yeah, if you played the Metaphor Refantasio demo, let me know in the comments below what your favorite parts were, what you thought of the demo, and how excited you are for the main game to release. And like I said earlier in this video, if you want to know more about Metaphor Refantasio, check out my other videos about the game and check out the vod on my live stream as well i have an entire metaphor refantasio playlist which i'll add in the description down below with all the videos that i've done about this game and of course give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more content from yours truly nishkook pops on nintendo jrpgs and metaphor refantasio this is nishkook signing off have a great day go play some great games today like the Metaphor Refantasio demo, which is available on all systems except for the Nintendo Switch. I'll see you guys in the next one later. Hey guys, this is Nishquick. Thank you so much for watching that video. And if you enjoyed it, check out these two videos on the left and maybe subscribe if you haven't on your way out. And big shout out to all my channel members whose names you can see on the screen right now. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.